Okay, good morning and thanks for coming in here today. My name is Matthew Terry and I work with Jason Anker and I have been doing so for the last two years of the journey of when I first met him. He did seem like a nice guy at the time and uh, we've, we've, done, we've done some great work in the last two years and Jason's been on this journey from not speaking in front of audiences at all, not even sharing his, his story in front of his friends and family and not owning up to it himself. Um, my background is um, eight years in the military and then eight years as a full-time firefighter. I then joined Skanska Construction uh, in the UK and delivered various safety sessions. Um, following that, I went into Bovis Lend Lease and carried on with sort of CITB type courses. And then my relationship started into behavioral safety. And I probably spent the first two years of being into behavioral safety, trying to figure out exactly what behavioral safety was. And I'm sure you've been curious yourself um, in the past of trying to put your finger on what is behavioral safety. And I think for me, um, all the legislation, the policy and procedures and all the safety management systems, etc., that we have out there and all of the equipment as you're walking around and all the, all the ideas that are coming out, is there anything else that we need to keep people safe? And this is where we are at the moment with, with safety, I suppose. So behavioral safety is a lifestyle choice. It just doesn't switch on when we come into work. Behavioral safety is everything that we do. And just to share a few ideas and a few theories that I have of, of, of your relationship to, to behavioral safety is when was the last time you checked the tire pressures in your car? Okay, have you got a carbon monoxide uh, alarm type test next to your boiler at home? You know, do you hold the handrails when you're going up and down the staircase? And, and a lot of the sessions that I do, and I think safety, especially toolbox talks these days, are so general, people are bringing off information off a system, and they're so general as in, are you safe? People are going to say, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I try to be safe. I, I'm, I consider myself safe. But until you actually specifically break down a task, I, I, I do it generally when in construction, with primarily like still saws or grinders and stuff like that, and get the lads to talk about the different areas of using that piece of kit. You know, the system, the workplace, um, the machine itself, and then the PPE. And they come up themselves with 25, 30 items that would help them keep themselves safe. And until you go through every single one and say, so for every single cut, have you always got your ear defenders on when you're working by yourself? And they say, no. So you cross that one off. Have you always got your goggles on for every single cut? And they say, no. And you cross that one off. And you go through the whole 25. And in general, you're left with about five. And the five are just the boots that they've got on the feet, the high-vis jacket that they've got on the back, the helmet that they have on, and because the site's running at 110 volt. So that says to me that we will just work in whatever habit we've got. So in, in my whole understanding of behavior, all the courses that I've done, all the studying and the workshops that I run, behavioral safety comes down to habits, and that's it. And the habits that you've actually got, if you were a sterile person, would you work with those habits today? And the answer is probably no. The people who are most at risk in what we do are the people who know what they're doing. The habits that they've got are the habits that they had to take from the people that they wanted to join in with when they first joined the group of people or the industry that they were working with. And these are the bad old habits, and they just took them on board because they wanted to fit in. So how do we change habits? Well, I've mentioned a few of our habits at home, and I'll bring up the classic lawnmower type thing and what do we wear on our feet when we're mowing the lawn at home. But even so, the strimmer, when we finished off, do we actually put, put some sort of safety glasses on when we're actually on the strimmer? But because we're at home and we're working basically for ourselves and it doesn't apply at home, do we choose to do it? Behavioral safety is choosing to do it. And I've mentioned how do you break habits. Well, the habits that you have to break are those habits. And what you'd have to do is basically put a pair of safety shoes in a carrier bag, put them on top of the lawnmower, or put a pair of safety glasses right next to the strimmer so you physically have to either take them off and put them back on the shelf when you choose not to wear them. So behavioral safety is about breaking people's habits. You'd have to go up to whatever it is when you've got the Sunday roast in and the veg and everything's on the go and you're thinking about all of the bits and pieces. You have a half hour gap to mow the lawn. You're busy. The Jew. Have you got the wine in the fridge, etc.? 
and you go up to the machine and you think, right, there they are. I now have to make a conscious choice. Am I going to put them to one side, or am I going to actually put them on my feet? So this comes back to, are you consciously competent, or are you consciously incompetent? OK. So in a lot of sessions we've done, we've done a lot with uh, all various companies, power sectors, the lot, a lot of work and a height. And I knew, as, as, as good as I was in the, in the training room, I could never, ever push it um, to, to the maximum effect of where we are today. And the way to get proper leverage on people to change is to have somebody in the room who's actually had an accident themselves. DVDs are great. And you're just about to watch a great DVD now of Jason. But until the person's actually in the room and you're looking at the person's eyes who's had the accident, then you might get the leverage to change because it's not an arm's distance away. I'll pop the DVD on for you now, and then Jason's going to share a few of his experiences over the last 14 years. I'm Jason Anker. In January 1993, when I was 24 years old, I went to help my father-in-law on a roofing job. I wasn't a roof by trade, but work and money were scarce, and I had a young family to support. At the end of the day, we were called over to fix a leaky roof. I noticed the ladder wasn't tied on, but I said nothing. If I had, I wouldn't have spent every day since in a wheelchair. I worked in spinal cord injury for over 25 years now and um, the hardest part of doing it is actually having that conversation with what are commonly young people and, and very often young men uh, and uh, there is absolutely no doubt that what happens to them changes their life completely and changes the life of everyone around them. And I remember a nurse, she came over to me and she sort of said Calm down. You're not doing anybody any favours by shouting. And I said, calm down? Now I can't feel my fucking legs. And the doctor's called, and it brings along with him one of these. A bag. A bag of piss. And I have to wear one of these every day. I've got one of these on, on my leg all the time. And I hate it. What aspects of the change that occurs with paralysis do people find the most difficult to, to deal with? If you ask someone who was paralysed and in a wheelchair for a couple of years, they would almost invariably say that they didn't really care too much about the walking side of things, but they would wish to have their bladder and bowel control back and to have sexual functions. We are just normal, ordinary family. And trust me, it can happen to anybody, and it does, every day. The main reason I didn't speak up, the simple fact is I didn't think it was going to happen to me. Stop and think before you do anything. You know, everything's got to be done safe, safely. You only get one chance. <laughs> well, they are something which completely alters not just their life, but the life of everyone around them. I've just had an incident with an exploded water bottle, so I'm covered in water. Um, how did I get here? I mean, I still can't believe I'm doing what I do. Because for sort of 16 years, I would not spoke about this to anybody. You know, not my mum, you know, my family, mum and dad. I hadn't even spoke about it to myself. And I'm sat at the back there just thinking how bizarre it is, watching a DVD of me sat at the back doing these speeches. Um, but I've learned by doing it over the last sort of 18 months that it's not about me. You know, I don't speak, especially when I'm talking to industry and the operatives, that it's not about somebody listening to me and feeling sorry for me. You know, my accident's already happened. My, my reason for doing this is just so the people I'm talking to imagine that this has happened to them. Um, I normally speak for about 45 minutes, and I've got 10. So I'll do a bit, it's more of a recap, obviously you've seen the DVD. Um, 
Can you just pass one of these? When I sort of talk about all this stuff, I mean, I never used to mention this when I first started speaking, so personal. And I just thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to talk about everything. And that's what I'll do. I'll talk about sex, everything. But the reason I'll talk about my bags is, I now um, look at this as a part of my kit. I have a procedure I have to do, change these bags religiously once a week. So now that the chance of me having an accident have been reduced because I look after my kit. So if the guys look after their kit when they're working, the chances of an accident are reduced. Now, accidents may still happen, you say. And yes, these bags could still leak. So everywhere I go, I carry a bag of spare clothes. Again, so if something goes wrong, I can go and change myself. So I've got a routine of looking, managing my, my bladder. And obviously, I'll have to learn one of managing my bowels. So if you can imagine, in the early days, I'd be away from home, had a few big drinks with your mates, you hadn't been to the toilet for a couple of days, and you'd basically do it in front of your mates. So over the years, again, I've learned a routine of emptying my bowels, and I do it in the morning, go to the toilet every morning, watch what I eat, watch what I drink. So if you can imagine, if you'd had a skinful and been to a curry house, you wouldn't go swimming the next day. So I'll lead you on to my next story. I'd gone swimming one day. And it was daytime, a load of old ladies in the bus, and I get in the pool, and I start doing my lengths as normal. And I've done a couple of lengths, and that's sort of peripheral vision. I sort of notice people are getting out of the pool. And I get to the top, and there stood the lifeguard. And she says to me, um, Jace, you're going to have to stop. So straight away, I just thought, oh, my God, I've done it in the pool. And I'm, I'm not really listening to what she's saying. I start to pay attention, and she's holding something in her hand. And I start thinking, you know, what's that she's holding? And I thought, they look remarkably like my trunks. So it wasn't quite as bad. But then if you can imagine, how do I get a pair of trunks on in the pool when I can't lift my legs up. So it took me about 15 minutes to get my trunks on, and I clams out of the pool, really embarrassed, and um, get myself dressed. And I thought, well, the lifeguard knows, and a few people have all, it's over. And I'm just about to leave you know, the swimming bath, and the receptionist just shouts me and says, make sure you bring your trunks next time. Um, never really lived it down again. Um, but I think one of the hardest things uh, for me to go is discrimination. You know, I am discriminated against every single day of my life. Football, cinemas, not having proper access. Um, went last night, was invited to the Rosper Do at the Hilton. And when we get to the entrance, all the tables were set out, and we suddenly start panicking. Our table was at the front, and we had no way of getting me through all the crowd. So I had to go outside, round the back, through a fire escape, and sat on this table. I mean, the guys on this table was absolutely horrendous. Oh, there's a couple of them back there, actually. <laughs> um, but it just goes to show, everywhere I go is discrimination. Places haven't got toilets. But at the end of the day, I looked at it that I went up a ladder, it wasn't tied on, and I live with the consequences. And maybe people are thinking, well, fair enough. But at the end of the day, it ain't just about me. I'm watching my dad cry still at the back of the room, it still sort of chokes me. And before we did the DVD, I used to talk about my dad that if I ruined my dad now and told him I got a punch in my wheelchair, my dad would break down and cry like that. If I ever get him to come to the pub for a couple of drinks, he always leaves before he gets like that. And this is after 18 years. My mum comes across quite well on the DVD. But actually, my mum still sees a counsellor, and she's still antidepressants. You know, not 18 months after my accident, this is 18 years, and I feel totally responsible. My family, my brother and my sister, my brother, it's took him the best part of 18 years for us to have a proper relationship. He couldn't deal with the fact that I couldn't deal with being in a wheelchair. And even now, he still doesn't actually look me in the eye 
because he feels guilty that he wasn't there for me. But at the end of the day, it was my fault. All the stuff I did to my family, drink, drugs, I caused all this hardship on my family because of something I did at work. But I think the biggest thing I've lost is with my children. I mean, my daughter Abba's now 21, the apple in my eye, she lives with her boyfriend, never really gave me an ounce of problems. But I think one of the hardest things I remember what I miss out on my children is, um, do you know, like when you've been learning to ride a bike and they have the stabilizers on and it comes to the big day and you've took the stabilizer off the bike and you hold onto the bike seat and you make them a promise and usually promise them something along the lines of you're not going to let go. Well, as they get sort of pedaling away on the bike and you sort of let go and they pedal sort of 10, 20 feet down the path. And it's that moment for the first time and they put their foot down on the bike, suddenly realize they rode a bike for the first time and they look, they look back up the path and you sort of well up inside about how proud it makes you feel. At the end of the day, my dad learned my daughter to ride a bike, not me. And these are the things that matter more to me that I've lost than all this. Um, you know, what's going to happen when my daughter gets married and I'm supposed to be walking her down the aisle? Again, I've lost this through something I did at work. Um, my son Sam came to live with me when he was eight years old. He lived with his mum, but when he was eight, he'd come to live with me. Um, my dad had gone to pick him up and I always remember the day, it was a lovely summer's day, and he come walking down the drive, a little backpack on, some of his clothes his mum had sent. But what do the old lads carry with them? Absolutely everywhere. Yeah, football. And I don't know how I'd missed it, because football was such a massive part of my life. But to be sat on a patio, watching my dad kick a football around the garden with my son, and to suddenly have that realisation that I was never kicking football with my boy. And I went in the house and I absolutely sobbed. And again, I lost this through something I did at work. But when kids are little, they don't really ask you too many questions. But when Sam was about 11 or 12 and he'd come home from school, and he actually asked me why I did, you know, why are you in a wheelchair, Dad? It was probably one of the hardest conversations. You know, I wanted to tell him I'd been involved in a car accident or I'd nearly died. But to actually tell him the reason I'm in a wheelchair is through something I did at work. You know, I fell 10 feet from a ladder. And if you can imagine the look on his face. And that's probably why I've had a lot of problems with Sam over the years. And got my compensation. And I've done some magical things. Um, scuba diving parachute jumps, micro lighting, built up in gliders. Magical experiences I never would have done before my accident. And nothing, no amount of compensation, has come close to making it worthwhile being in a wheelchair. As I always say to anybody, there ain't nothing good about being in a wheelchair apart from shoes. Because the argument I was having with somebody wanted some new trainers, and he turned around to me and said, Dad, it's all right for you. Your shoes are always like brand new. So in his wisdom, the only good thing about being in a wheelchair is you get cracking value out of your shoes. And that is it. Um, like I say, I know I talk for about 45 minutes. And, you know, I can't stress, this is about me. This is about me talking to the guys and then realizing their actions at work what they do on a daily basis, their habits, if they are bending the rules, if they are taking chances, and they know they're doing wrong, this is what they're risking. Thank you much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. What you Thank thought you. of uh, Jason Stock? So, very good. It really brings it home, but I think the guys and sight. Pretty moving stuff, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. What do you think of the uh, talk from Jason? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Very, very moving. Very moving. Powerful to 
obviously his expression is um, his real life experiences with his family um, and I can I really sympathise for, for the guy and uh, it's something that uh, I would like to take to my workplace and uh, 